and every single one you're going to take some nuggets but i think more importantly um what i got in from this is here's this doctor who's been out 10 years who what seems like runs a very successful practice who gets to talk to all of these big names we'll call them and he is still learning at all times you can be you know sebastian oh and interesting i wouldn't have thought you would have said that <laughs> You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey guys, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez, your host for the Restoring Human Movement podcast. Thanks for joining the movement. Movement! We're going to have an extra special guest on today. This is going to be a student. Uh, I'll let you tell. I'll let him tell he, tell you all about himself. But I'm going to have a student on today, and this is somebody who has been listening to roughly about ninety percent of the podcasts that I've released. So I've released almost 140 podcasts. He's listened to a ton of them, and so what I'm interested in is is has this improved his schooling experience, or how he's going to practice in any way, shape, or fa- any way, shape, or fashion. I my goal is to get people to um, improve how they practice sooner than I did. I didn't really improve my practice uh, in regards to um, improving my patient outcome really significantly until about five years out of practice. And there's a lot of things that I wish I would have known now that I sh- uh, wish I, that I know now that I wish I would have known in school. And so I'm hoping to share all that kind of stuff. And if you listen to a lot of the podcasts, I've shared a ton already. And so now I kind of want to see how things are going. It hasn't been improving things on the other side. And so I'm going to have a series of where I'm going to start interviewing some some students, some chiropractic, some PT, some uh, athletic training students, and just see how things go um, and see if I can improve my services uh, to you guys um, and see where I need to improve um, my content as it gets to you guys in the next coming episodes. So um, I'm going to have on, I think, one every one every month, roughly every second uh, week of the month on a Wednesday is going to release. And so uh, I already have a few lined up, by the way. Also, too, and this is, I, I'm, I'm going to pitch this again just because I know it will change your uh, practice career. If you're a student and if you wondered about how to use corrective exercise or how to lo- use loading or how to use uh, resistance training or where to patch things in in people's care, when do they need tissue work, when do they need adjustments, when do they need uh, pain trigger reduction, when do they need first aid, uh, I'm going to go through all this kind of stuff that I've learned, at least through the people that I've interviewed as all as well as all the workshops that I've been to. I'm going to do a, a workshop on my own. And it's the very first one. It's in June 8th and 9th in Huntington Beach. It's in my own clinic. There's only like 20 spots. And I think as of right now, there's probably one left. I don't do really good bookkeeping on this, but for the most part, there's not a lot left. So if you're interested in that, direct message, direct message me on Instagram, that's performance HB, or just email me, seb at p2sportscare.com. To be honest with you, this that whole workshop was not my idea. Um, I had some students, or not students, but um, I, my classmates mentioned something about, hey, let's all get together and do some CEs. By the way, why don't you put them on? And so I said, hey, that's a good idea. You know, like they're like, hey, why don't we do it at a uh, at the at draft picks over in uh, Whittier where we used to all go to the bar after going to school. And I said, well, we can't do it at a bar, but uh, we can do it in my office and we can ha- have steaks and beer after. You know, so um, I put it all together and I only had a handful of my classmates actually sign up. And I realized, you know what, I'm like, you know what, I think the listeners would like it. And so this is how this this thing really started. And there was scaled um, scaled pricing in there and there's early bird, I guess, extra early bird and so on. And I realized that the top level was $400 or sorry, $500 at the door. I don't, I, I, I want, I, I did, I just wanted to be a party. Honestly, I just want to hang out and learn from all you as well. So I didn't really want to charge much at all. But when I started doing all of the learning what CE costs to actually put on and I ended up becoming a thing and I had to present, uh, also what I was going to present to you guys and becoming work is, is the point. So if I do this workshop again, and I don't know if I'll do it again, it's going to cost more. So if you're looking to save some money and learn shit that's going to change your way of practicing from me and all the stuff I've learned from all the people on the podcast, uh, please attend. All right. I, I really want to shape the profession. This is probably the easiest way. Um, and honestly, from the people who have shadowed, a lot of students have shadowed me. They, they, they want to learn all of these things, but they're learning it in bits and chunks through like a four hour shadowing session. If you want crash course, just go, just come. I would love more students than clinicians to honestly come to this, but 
Uh, so it's going to be a good time. Everyone want to have Tom Hawk steaks and beer or whiskey or whatever. We're going to have it all after. So anyways, uh, last part before we actually go into the interview is that every time I try to share a little bit about myself through a personal story or a rant. So I'm going to share that right now. We're gonna, then we're going to get right into the podcast. Please subscribe, share this with a fellow student. And here we go. So back in the day growing up, I, I didn't really have, um, I didn't have a ton of money. Like we weren't poor or anything. Um, and we definitely had enough money to survive, but I never really asked my parents for a lot of money. And so I wasn't, uh, I wasn't taken care of that way, uh, although my dad might tell you different. He's like, they were spoiled brats, but I never really asked him for money. I'd say, hey, dad, give me 200 bucks, you know, type of thing. So anyways, I was I grew up kind of frugal. And so uh, one thing that I thought was kind of always a waste of money was uh, greeting cards, or especially like Valentine's Day cards, birthday cards, and so on. So there was one time that I bought a card for somebody. And I took a piece of paper and I wrote in on the paper and put it in the envelope and didn't seal the envelope and put it in the card. And so when they got the card, they read the piece of paper and the card was blank. And I said, here's the gift that keeps on giving. You can just return that and get about five bucks back. So it was kind of like, you know, it served its purpose, but you don't really need to write on the card. Um, I wasn't going to keep the card. They weren't going to keep the card. It's just going to be a toss and throw away. So and uh, also, too, back in the day, I used to draw cards. Uh, me and a friend used to actually, for his, I think it was his birthday, maybe it was Christmas, I forget. Um, but you'd, you'd, you'd do a wrap in, in the card. Uh, and I would draw my own card. Again, I'd just do it on paper because I like drawing, as you've seen probably. But anyways, so we do these wraps. So if I could find one, I'll actually do one on air. Uh, he might have some, but I thought they were pretty clever. They are probably about like 30-second wraps. Real cool. All right, now onto the content. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Just came from wet labs of cadavers. Oh, I, I was going to say, I was wondering, when you said wet lab, I was like, it sounds messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cadavers. Yeah. yeah. Like dry lab and wet lab. Are you still wearing your smock, your jacket too? Yeah, it's like a white coat sort of thing, but we don't, we didn't touch anything today. I'm only in the third week, so it was just him showing us, or the professor. Oh, really? But it just, I remember just reeking like from aldehyde, like we just... Yeah, <laughs> it, it does. It does smell. It smells in here. Yeah. What? What? <laughs> I, root, or are you? You're at? Oh, you're at school, so you're in a little room over there. Yeah, I'm in a study room. Mm, got it. I think that's the best way to keep quiet in in a school. Probably. So what's up? Nothing. I'm excited. I'm, I'm really excited. It's, it's good to see you and meet you. Actually. Yeah. Good to meet you too. Nine. It is impressive number. Ninety percent listen. I don't think I've heard ninety percent of my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I w- I've definitely gone through everything in 2018 and 2019, um, and I'm like in 2017s, and then I listen. I haven't listened to this morning's yet. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, you didn't put it out early enough, you know. Oh, oh, what time? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it goes four o'clock uh, Pacific. I think uh, so. That's so I th- seven thirty. Yeah, so I school so for school for me starts at um at seven thirty, and oh. I live an hour away from the school, oh. so I drive. So that gives me a good enough time to listen to a lot of podcasts. Well, I'll tell you, maybe I should start doing it at three o'clock. <laughs> oh, you're good. I mean, I listen to a lot. I mean, I that's one of the, that was one of the things that I wanted to mention on the podcast was uh, just the communication and stuff just with you. It's I like your podcast so much just because it when you start off with the stories and stuff like that, mm-hmm. it just makes you feel like I know you. Mm-hmm. And that automatically makes a podcast just almost like mean more. Um, yeah. Same thing with like patients and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, well, thanks. I uh, I've wondered. I as you've probably heard over the course of the years, I've I've done them in a different style. But mm-hmm. um, I remember in in one I sent uh, one of the one of the one of the interviewers I sent it to them for review, and they're like they're like, why did you put that in? No one cares about that. And I said, uh, I'm like, I don't know. It feels it feels right. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, so. it, it's, it's really cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. You want, there's one where like you're singing. Yeah. And one of them and stuff like that. <laughs> don't get me wrong. That one but, was um, an old one. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. I actually heard it the other day. It is. Um, but like, usually I'll skip, like if I know it's coming, like, um, like, and I listen to other podcasts, they'll have like an ad reader or whatever. And I'll usually just like, cause you can do the 30 second skip. Mm-hmm. But with yours, I don't do that. And like, I didn't think about it until we said we we're going to do this podcast. And so I started thinking about like the different things about it. And I was like, Hey, like, I think I like it because it's like, almost like I'm listening to a conversation instead of like somebody just speaking to me, I guess it's a little different than like an audio book and stuff, something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, nice. That's how I, 
like your your audio book too is it felt like just a five hour long podcast or whatever it was man that, that i tell you that audio book was the, i think was the hardest thing i've ever done in my, <laughs> my life <laughs> How many times did, you, uh, did you have the, was it was just one take or no there's a, actually so so with these with the po- with these podcasts like i i don't i don't really edit much unless there was like there was a couple that i, had, I one i bleeped uh and there was a couple that i clipped out a little bit just because it wasn't it was like an ongoing something else mm-hmm. Um, but that one, it, it's because there's, you remember popcorn is cool. Did you have popcorn? Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to kind of go like, you can't change the story at will. So it was kind of like it, it had to f- kind of follow. So as I started to read it, I started realizing that I could have probably written that better cause it doesn't flow off my tongue. And so then I started ad libbing a little bit and so on, but they chopped up. And so that one I had to send actually to, uh, a professional, uh, audio person and he took yeah. out the the clips that sounded like or the the, the clip points you know mm-hmm. but he did a good job it's cheap too by the way so <clears throat> yeah but far away from uh doing anything like that but still <laughs> well in case yeah. you ever want to yeah. um so actually i didn't tell you uh we're actually recording already and oh, okay. <laughs> i i i found that in the past when when I'm speaking with people like you, like some of the really good stuff is, is in the recording before or pre-recording. And so I, I was going to give you the opportunity to cut it out, but, but I think the, the communication was good. So I'm going to leave it if you're good. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm definitely, that was one of the things I wanted to talk about anyway. I just think that's probably, if not the most important thing that we do is being able to communicate, right. Cause that, that can lead to so much buy-in and it can lead to the patient wanting to do it. Um, especially the at home stuff. If you don't, uh, if you don't communicate um, correctly, then it's just, it's so hard. That's why I always, I, I, I heard the recommendation from when I was an undergrad to uh, not go and straight into grad school and go and work um, at a clinic, A, because you're about to put in $100,000 minimum in, mm-hmm. in student loans possibly. And so make sure you like it and B, um, just to kind of feel more comfortable. So I definitely... I think the biggest thing that I got in, um, ahead of, of it was just that I was dealing, I was doing the rehab portion um, of the, when the patients came into clinic. Um, so I was spending 30 minutes with them and I got so good at communicating whether how good I was at doing the actual rehab stuff um, is iffy, but the, uh, the communication with me, I have no problem talking to somebody and explaining to them. And especially since I, I wasn't yet through the graduate school stuff, it's not like I had this big, um, terminology of all the medical stuff. Mm-hmm. It was just, I, it, I was at ten, technically speaking in my own terms and they were layman's terms and I learned them. And um, I think that was the best part about it. And that's what I would really recommend to students. Or even if you're in grad school, go shadow and try to get as much time in front of people that aren't your peers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, or if you're out of, if you're out of work, go and do uh do a, a, a case where like you're bringing people in telling them you're going to sp- speak about low back pain. I, I go to uh, a person, a PT that does it, that works out of a CrossFit gym. He's got a, a room out at a CrossFit gym and every, the first of every Saturday he does uh, either low back pain or whatever. And it's usually people in his CrossFit, but I sign up, it's $10 and I go and I learn and mm-hmm. I know the FM, FMS and the SFMA and all that stuff that he's saying, but he's speaking it in layman's terms and i think that's so important to practice that it's something that you don't get in school because it's always peers or professors so it's a lot different i think that's one of the hardest things about getting from school to getting out yeah i, I do too actually um actually you know what um I'll, I'll i'll come back to this one sec tell everyone your name and a little bit about yourself because we've gone this far <laughs> <laughs> I'm myself. Yeah. Uh, my name is geronimo Bejarano. Uh, i'm a quarter one student at palmer florida uh I initially was going to do PT and then I was told to get a job before I make sure that I go and invest all this money. And I ended up getting hired by a chiropractic clinic that was doing, let's say a lot of rehab, but it was a lot of cookie cutter rehab. And unfortunately for me, unfortunately for the patients, I didn't get a lot of, of tutoring or showing what to do or anything like that. But fortunately for me, I got in, I joined a bunch of clubs on Facebook. I listened to your podcast. I read McGill's books. Um, I read a lot of stuff and I just got better. Um, And I think that was one of the biggest things for me was how much better I saw myself get with patients and speaking to them. So that's kind of 
what sets me apart at school um, and why I'm uh, a little more advanced at, with certain things and I'll have a little more biases or certain things, mm -hmm. especially when you're in chiropractic school and how much straight and mixer and subluxations and professor biases you, you can get. So it's a little different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you probably remember. Yeah, that was, seems like, doesn't seem like that long ago. That was 10, 10 years ago for me, I think. Um, just get, so you read all that stuff and, and you started doing all this before you actually school then. Yeah, I mean, I was doing it probably a month or two. And I started just, the more you listen and the more, especially with your podcast, you had so many people on. I mean, I, I don't remember if I heard of Stu McGill from you or if I heard it prior and this is what led me to it because I essentially went and just searched Stu McGill on the podcast app and I just listened to every podcast that he's been on. And then <laughs> I, I essentially did that. And I don't know if that's how I found this podcast or somewhere else. It's been over a year now. But I did that for Stu McGill. I've done that for Craig Liebenson. Um, and then lately, I've been doing a lot of the pain science guys. So like Peter O'Sullivan um, and Greg Lehman, stuff like that. Um, I think that part is fascinating to me as well as the pain science guys. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's inter uh, my I, I've always been interested how I mean, people like Stu does a really good job of like he interviews really well. Yeah. Um, and in in. And a lot of them, I know he asked me this, he, he said, you know, like, oh, Sebastian, do you, what would you like me to call you, you know? And so, and then he'll, he'll call you by whatever he asks, but, and he'll, he'll call you by name frequently throughout. And so I think there's, there's a bit of, I don't want to say coaching with that, but it's like, like just for working with, with people, like they, they resonate well when you, when you say their name a lot, you know? And uh, so I, I think those people on those podcasts, the ones that are the more, noteworthy ones whether they're good or bad they're really good at communication you know yeah and so I, that was one thing that i heard like I, I just recently listened to your dan john one so it was 61 mm -hmm. um i listened to that one and you guys spent the first 30 minutes talking about communication mm -hmm. and um i almost every single one of them whether it's mcgill or any of them you guys at some point talk on communication and i think that's so important especially with all the I would say lies being told or things that I guess it's not a lie that if the doctor doesn't know any better, but, um, and just trying to create this dependency. And I think that's the hardest part, especially when you come out and you have all these loans and, um, it's hard to remember that. And you wrote this on, um, on the checklist sort of thing that you said, you the things that you wish you knew in school is just with all these loans, don't forget that you're doing this for the patient and don't try to, uh, you know, do these long care plans and th different things like that. And that's, that's a big part of the communication part is making sure that they understand mm -hmm. um, that something that they, they can buy into um, something that they can do for themselves and create independent people and independent patients. And I think that that's the hardest part, especially coming out of school is knowing the communication because everything else is just stuff you'll learn. Yeah. The, the, uh, I don't know if you've experienced it yet, but I know that uh, just as, as you're speaking, uh, about that it it reminded me that i feel like there i don't know when this became a thing but i feel like people started to distrust their doctor yeah um in the recommendations and i don't know if it's just chiropractic or pt or whatever like mds but it's like they like whatever you're recommending there's there's this there's this unsaid thing in their head where they're like hmm, i don't know my, my mom told me that 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 this guy's gonna say that and i shouldn't do that you know but your recommendation should be so pure that it's like, why is this person not like yeah, complying? Exactly. No, I'd actually, I actually think that's a good thing for people to be skeptical though. Um, both as students to your professors and to the doctors that you're listening to. Um, and I don't think you should take anybody's word at a hundred percent, especially with the way that research works is we're getting closer to the truth, but we're never going to get to the truth. So it's just about being less wrong. Um, so it, like the stuff that you put out is great now, but if we look back at five years ago, you're probably going to look back at some of the stuff you've said and he's like, Oh, well, this is completely wrong now. But as long as it's the truth for you now and you're staying up to date with things, uh, I think that's the perfect way. But I think people should be skeptical of any, anything. I think that's the best way to learn and yeah. the best way to make sure that you're hearing the correct information. Um, I am so skeptical um, with some of the stuff that I'm learning now. And it's just, I don't, try to make a fool out of myself in school but i also try to ask questions like where do you get this research from like where, where are you getting this stuff from especially with cairo school 
there's a lot of stuff that is great and there's a lot of stuff that's kind of just it's been a while mm-hmm. um it's it's been a while since we thought not like that and so and that's one of those things that i've just managed to know so much uh, by podcast and by reading before coming into school so that kind of lets me have a source of skeptical but also a little bit of bias i guess i'll say towards maybe the rehab portion or the independence portion mm-hmm. of, of things like that well so is there anything in school yet that that kind of changed your mind about like what what your preconceived notion was about that one topic not really um it's just a lot of it right now is i i the, the only thing that I, I did find is that there are people that are just going to come to you a lot and they're going to need you and i don't think that i think that those people also need help i don't think it's wrong for people that just need you to need they won't do things outside of the office mm-hmm. and it's sometimes you're no matter how much you communicate it and as and i would rather them come to me and me continue to try to grow that independence and go, you know, next door to the guy that's going to sell them three times a week for the next three months, and then one time a month for the rest of your life, sort of ordeal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's, um, I, I think in the in the past, I, I give patients or lay public a little bit more. Um, I gave more credit to be able to do what's what's asked of them, but they, I think at least the people that come in and see us sometimes they get that way for a reason. Um, and so I mean, there's people, I have people that come back to me weekly. I don't have a ton of them, but they just, they're, uh, I think the last podcast that came out was on, um, resistance training as an exit plan to care, or mm-hmm. at least was one of the last two. And so I, like, I tend to get them out of like the treatment and corrective exercises as quick as I can and then could them, get them into load. And then it just looks like a personal training session with someone yeah. who knows your condition or what the condition was. Um, but they enjoy it, you know, and, uh, I, like I've attempted to take, uh, tell some of these people to go to a, a different gym. And then like my personal experience was that it's some of the, some of the coaches or trainers know what I'm asking for, um, or the program that I would like for them and other ones don't. And it's, it's kind of like, I, I, I can choose to keep this person in office to help them go through the plan that I have laid out for them, or I can choose to educate the other person, which then yeah. this is like, do I want to do that? <laughs> it might take longer than it's worth. Um, you know, so, uh, but I guess that's going with your, like, the referral sources of knowing who's going to do the job that you want to be done, you know? Exactly. And, I, and I've and i heard a lot about this, and it's funny because I used to not think like this about two years ago, was that all of your doctors, whether it's Cairo, PT, or anything like that, um, that you're going to, they shouldn't be, it's not that they should be gym rats, but they should at least know their way around a gym. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually, when I first heard it, I was, and I wasn't huge into going to the gym. I played soccer, but it was, I was more of good at the skill and not so much a good athlete. I just managed, I played a lot of it. So it was, it wasn't, I never needed to hit the gym. It wasn't anything like that. Um, so it was, I, I didn't know my way around the gym. So I had this bias toward like, are you serious? I can't be a good, uh, chiropractor or physical therapist without ever doing you know a deadlift and then i got into the work into the job and i wanted to get them to load and i was like how am i going to teach a deadlift if (laughs) i've never done one myself or cue all of these things um even down to like the mcgill big three which is such simple movements but if you don't know what to do or how you've never done them it's really hard to cue them so Mm -hmm. i started doing them myself and i realized hey i'm not so good at something so simple as doing you know, a, the Miguel big three or anything like that. Um, and it was, I had to go somewhere to, for somebody to cue me. Sometimes you just need to, to be cued your way through it. Just like you said, with you went to Cody when you had the the low back pain and stuff like that. Sometimes you just need somebody there to, to tell you, and you just need to listen and you learn so much from working out and working on your own body mm-hmm. that you don't, you, you learn all of that. And it's stuff that you just don't see in school, at least not in Cairo school is, is, hey, you should be going to the rehab center. It's free here. And Mm -hmm. we have a great rehab center. And uh, uh, there's a lot of students that are going to go through the whole entire school and never even go to the rehab center or never, you know, get adjusted or anything like that. And I think you can learn so much by being treated. Mm. That's a good point, actually. Like, so when we went through school, like we didn't, uh, 
we we would go to the clinic to help out the clinician that you were kind of assigned to, you know, to get their credits. But it really wasn't about us. Um, and that's a good point, though, is that the experience, if you go to the clinic at school, you're not only giving them uh, some credits, but also you're learning the patient experience. Um and I know, so your, your, your school has a, has a rehab area and a weightlifting center too now? Or? Yeah, so, so what happens is the clinic itself is the, what everybody has to go through towards those like last nine or 10 quarters for us. It's 13 quarters total. That last um, 10, 11, and 12 quarters, you're in the clinic um, treating patients for what I imagine is very low cost um, around here, around in Port Orange. Um, people can come in and you get you just know that you're getting a student doctor. So I imagine it's very low cost. I don't know what the actual price is, but the the students that go to go here and the faculty and your significant others and stuff like that all go in for free um, if you want to be treated. That's mm-hmm. how it works here. And then there's a whole rehab side and you have a rehab doctor who's actually great here. I met him on the FTCA Facebook page and stuff like that. And he is an SFMA trainer and he does and he's it's one of those things that with just like with you and with him is you're always learning. I always see that you're always going to either uh, fix your own bag seminar or you're, I've seen you're doing a lot of stuff now with neurodynamic stuff and you're 10 years out of practice and you're still learning. I think that's a lot of, a lot of people get so caught up in opening up their own business. They forget that they need to continue learning at all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's hard to juggle both. I know know that. Are are you trying to, are you going to open your own clinic? You think, or are you going to, it, it's funny because I, at first I was, I was like, no way, this is so much work. And then I realized that it was one of those things where it just seems like a lot of work. So you don't do it. It's you get scared mm-hmm. of doing it. And it, and with us, it's just the way that I want to treat, um, which is a lot of how you do it. You know, you spend one-on-one time. I just feel like if you're going to ask somebody to pay for something, you need to be the one doing it. I don't like the idea of a CA, even though I was one doing that stuff, you paying X amount of money and you don't even get to see the doctor mm-hmm. um, except for the adjustment or something like that. Um, so I want, yeah, the idea is to open up your own and with uh, a lot, you've talked about a lot is the renting a room. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I did honestly, I didn't even know that was a thing. Until oh, really? <laughs> that it, uh, and then it's just, it's not, I don't know, there's stuff they don't tell us in school. Damn. I feel like that was like the simple, not, not, not to like, um, I feel like it's the simplest thing. Like that would make the best sense to me. And I know that with, I don't know if I wrote it in that little manual or not, or talked about it, but yet, but that some, some docs though, like they, like they want a piece of your pie, you know, like they'll, like, I'm of the thought that it's like, you just rent a flat rate room. Don't touch my business. Don't, don't screw with me. Like type of thing. Um, Mm -hmm. and if you're where with an established doc, like, and if your buddies just like, just allow the guidance of the business to occur that way, you know, but um, some of them are like, no, I'm not going to do flat rate. You know, like I'm going to, like, I want, I want a percentage of your income style thing, thing. And I would just steer clear of those. Just there's some dude around who just has a room sitting around, you know, hundred percent or a lot of, a lot of, a lot of CrossFit or out of, um, out of gyms. I've seen a, I follow a couple of the, the Instagram famous, we'll call them PTs. That are, <laughs> he's, out of um, he's out of a gym and he's got his own little space out of like a, a regular LA fitness. And then, there's a guy that I go to here in Winter Park. He's out of a CrossFit gym and he just has his own little space, his own table, and then he has access to everything and it's a flat rate. And eventually I imagine that he's the plan is to open up your own little business or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I know a lot of people have, especially in the chiropractic, which gives you so much business side. I feel like we get a lot of intra- entrepreneurs on this side mm-hmm. uh, between Cairo and PT just because it's so hard to get a good associate job. A lot of the people are, we kind of tend to eat our young is what they say. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just really low paying. So it just forces you to be an entrepreneur compared to PTs or just, they, they come out making almost double as much and they have such secure jobs, especially in like hospitals or big stuff like that. So I I think it's really important to, to understand that side of it. And I think it's, that's not something we get in school at all. I, I agree. I agree on all points. Actually, I think the PTs, they, they have more availability to them. Um, and they I think they're more accepted. They have, you know, probably still insurance covers clinics like that and so on. But, but yeah, I don't know if the listeners don't, don't know the reality yet. If you get out of school, chiropractic school, and you think you're going to make a living and you think you're going to get a job, you better, you better think twice. Cause like, I know that like say people that practice like me, I ain't hiring anybody. 
Like, and yeah. I, I tell interns that I'm not, I'm not going to hire you. You can rent a room if you want, but I'm not going to hire you. And, yeah. and the high volume clinics, like they're probably the ones that will do it. But then do, like, is that your style of practice or not? Um, but yeah, you're kind of forced into it. And if you're not learning how to run your own business or at least like market yourself, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and I don't know if you guys, you guys probably have it there. I know we had it at SCU, but so I think, I think the school's like rough style of like getting you to realize that you got to bring people in as they would tell you, you got to bring two patients in the clinic. So you'd pay your mom to do it, you know, yeah. or your sister. But I was actually thinking with any of the people that shadow to come see me, I'm and, and this is not like, I, I don't want, I don't, I don't want them to think that I'm trying to generate money off them, but in order for them to come see me, I want them to refer somebody, you know? I want to see that they're willing to work, because um, that's the hardest part: getting someone to get to come into your office with your communication and how much trust you have, and then and then collecting money from them on top of that. It's very hard, and it's so different because um, it's <clears throat> taking money for something that you deserve, and that's the hard part. But at the same time, it's like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not a sell- salesman. I don't want to do this, blah blah, blah. and it's it. it after a while though you have to you have to pay the bills you have to live and you deserve money for your expertise exactly but but it's something that it's learned i and i what i was i what i did learn is toastmasters go to toastmasters communicate and then from there on outside just go and get in front of as, as many people as possible and make sure, especially in your community, make sure that your name is known in, in your in your community. Depending mm-hmm. on how big your city is, that might be easier. That might be really hard. Like in Orlando, it's there's a lot of things going on, but you're competing with a lot of people, a lot of people in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that is one of the hardest things is just getting people to to believe in you, especially coming right out of school. They'll see you, you look, you know, fresh faced, 27, 28 years old. <laughs> And yeah, you just got to grow a massive beard yeah. or put gray in your yeah. hair. <laughs> that, that is, I guess that's one thing that you can do. Yeah. So do you, um, damn, I had a question on the top of my head, but I don't, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> you, you took it away from me, damn it. <laughs> um, yeah. So are you, you're going to, you're thinking about doing your own business then. Is that what, yeah, is that what I'm hearing? 100%. I think I, the plan is, to talk to as many people as possible. Honestly, the the big associate job coming out of at least Palmer, I'm not sure if it's anything else, is though they work a lot with the VA. Mm, mm-hmm. um, so that's in a hospital and that is very well paid coming out of school. And if you work with the VA long enough, they pay for, you get all the federal benefits. So they pay for your student loans, um, but those are extremely hard to get. Um, so, I think I'm going to work my way towards that. But if that doesn't happen, um, it would definitely be immediately into um, renting a room, I think, for myself. I mean, it just really depends on what options I have coming out of school. But that's what it's looking like is if I could get that VA job, that Mm -hmm. would be awesome. Yeah, that'd be Um, sick. But besides (laughs) that, uh, I just there's no reason for you to go and make like – 20% 20% of what you can make in one, you know, in one visit and make it all day. Um, especially with how little associate jobs are, are paid here. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I've had, I've had some friends that they, they were associates for like three, four years. And, uh, you know, they just, I feel like after they finally ventured out of that, they started business and they were kind of like, we're, I was at square one, you know, it was just a delayed process for the safety net of having a little bit of income. Um, but, and then you got to practice with the style that your doc wants, you know, and you, there's yep. not the freedom with it. Uh, oh, I know what my question was at this point in time, how much would you pay for a session with yourself? If you had, if you had sciatica? Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> uh, I just don't, I, I know. I mean, I, I it, it's funny because people were paying technically to see me and I don't know if I felt that I was worth it. I definitely would say I am worth coming to see in the first, at, at first in that first initial consult, because I can talk someone through what they should expect. Like last night I got a call from my mom and her coworker has low back pain and she went to a chiropractor, got adjusted she kept having low back pain. Then she went to an MD and he read an MRI on her. And 
she has L4, L5 disc herniations, and um, she he was told she was she told or the MD was told her that she should stop working because my parents clean houses for a living. So mm-hmm. she she should stop working because she has disc herniations and that that job is too labor intensive for her age or whatever. And she freaked out, did bed rest, all that stuff. And my mom called me to ask me, and I, and I had to explain. My my parents don't know anything about low back pain <laughs> or anything like that. So uh, I told her I'd call her, and then not only did I have to explain to her that she probably had those disc herniations for years, and she just now started getting low back pain, but I also explained to her the the stuff about being independent and finding somebody that's going to get her to find the different little things that she can do to get out of that pain immediately um, and that she can control her pain immediately. And then uh, explained to her, I liked what Dan John said in his book was that on his last day alive, he wants to be able to go to the mailbox. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I took it a little bit further and I said, I want to be able to go to the grocery store, get my groceries and carry them inside and put them away on whatever my last day is. And she, I feel like everybody, that should be everybody's end goal. Mm-hmm. whether they have short-term goals or not. Um, and that can be a little more aesthetic, but I think your um, your end goal should be that. Uh, you should be want to be independent of anybody else taking care of you for as long as possible. And you can't do that without exercise, nutrition, and proper sleep stuff. I think that I could do. I could talk to the, uh, an initial consult and explain to them and communicate all of those things. Um, but at, to actual treatment, I don't think I can do so. I, mm-hmm. What's it worth? I don't know. Maybe a hundred dollars. Well, so let, well, let's just go down. We'll go down this track a little bit with, because uh, you might change your mind. Uh, what is your mom doing now? Did she listen to you, or is she uh, did she do what uh, she was advised? So she got up that day. This was not my mom. This was my mom's coworker. But she okay. got up. And she went and she felt better and she felt more in control. And she told me that she thanked me. I sent her back mechanic. Um, by the, the link to buy back mechanic by McGill. And I told her that whatever, whoever she went to see, um, let me know what, how that first console was. And then I would tell her if she's headed in the right direction or not, um, whether depending on what different things they did, that they did in that first console in that first console. Um, does she feel better? I think so, mm-hmm. but um, whether or not, I, I think she still needs to go out and see somebody. Does she have a plan of attack? Do you think? Do you feel like she she knows what to do? Yes, definitely. Okay, and do you feel like she? Do you feel like she's going to do it? I do. Well, she told me she she told me herself that if I was in Palm, my parents are about two hours away. That if I was there, she's like, I'd pay you to work on me right now. And I was like, mm-hmm. I don't. Uh-huh. <laughs> what is it, You're like, well, I can't do that. I'm in school. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. Well, so then, yeah, I'm I'm gonna get to a point in this in in a couple minutes, but. Um, what do you think would have happened to her if you didn't, you didn't get to speak with her? I, I think she would have ended up at chronic pain. Potentially, mm-hmm. uh, they gave her steroids and then told her the next option was surgery. So potentially surgery. So, and how, how old, uh, roughly how old is she? Uh, all right. It's my mom's 60. So around that, at that age. Okay. And so, um, we talked about Dan John with going to the mailbox during last, last day. So, uh, if that were to happen, and I know I know this is just speculating, let's just say how long, how many more years would she have with um, being able to go to her mailbox? You know, probably and, not very really long at all. And then how long will she live? You know, and so yeah. the or at least, like actually live and not just be alive, right? So the, the reason I'm kind of going down this rabbit hole is is um, is I had a uh, uh, my my intern Jeremy or my past intern now he's a doctor, Doctor Jeremy Dinkins. Yeah, uh, I actually messaged him and he's he's awesome. Yeah, Jeremy's he's he's fun. I got to keep ta- sometimes I got to talk him off the ledge with with things. I'm sure he's listening, so uh, I do this just to help everyone else out, Jeremy. But so we were we were texting a little bit about like insurance or no insurance and so on, and I was like, dude, it's it's all about value, you know. And I, it, and he was talking about someone that had uh, I think it was about a back condition, or at least maybe I thought it was a back condition. I'm like, dude, I'm like, dude, sometimes they literally cannot have sex with yeah. back pain you know like they can't do so so many things that they value in life and y- you you want to like you want to like price is not a barrier anymore like i don't think like for for my expertise anyways with the one that came out today was actually uh, the podcast which was uh, sports hernias and so mm-hmm. i talk about spinal hinge versus hip hinge and uh l uh, l l2 l3 
uh, basically radiculopathy into the groin area, simulation yeah. of groin pain or sports hernia. And so I've had such good success with these types of cases that, and, and they come in literally not knowing what the hell to do. And they go through the, the route of the sports hernia and they're like, huh, there's nothing to do, right? And, so, and there's like, and then surprisingly on that side too, so there's the surgical, which, which they claim is the uh, way to go for a lot of cases. The surgery is actually not covered by insurance. And so it's no. like this one guy emailed me and he's like, dude, I'm a teacher. I don't have 10 grand, right? And so that rabbit hole of like crap that they got to go through, dude, I'd easily pay my, I'd easily, if I was them, if I knew it was on the other side, I'd pay myself $500,000 easily for like an hour of my time, you know? Oh, 100%. And so it, um, if I go down that rabbit hole to make sure that everyone's listening for pricing for business, it's like you are worth what you're saving that person from. A hundred percent. I think that that's the, the main thing is I don't, and it's easier said than done, but I don't just it, go out of network. Everybody ends up doing it, try to start off out of network, but it's so much when you're looking at how much your rent might be, or when you're looking at all these things and you have zero patients because you just started, it's so much easier to just be like, I have to do insurance. But I, I think that's the same thing as, oh, I have to be an associate coming out. You just have to face your fears. And if you really believe in yourself and you should, then you can charge what you feel that you are worth. And it's usually even, you are usually worth higher than you charge in, in our profession. Probably. <laughs> I know. I, I, I would strongly agree. What What's the average uh, chiropractic exam over there, by the way? Like what's a, what's a new patient exam in Florida? So, uh, you tell, you tell me, uh, are we talking about the <laughs> chiropractor that's going to take an x-ray the first time and then it's going to, you have, you know, you have your day one, day two type of chiropractor where you, well, you come I, well, I think we have to consider the uh, what does the patient see when you say go to a chiropractor and they say, oh, the exam is right. Yeah. So then that is that's then their perception of of what is the norm. Um, so I guess so I guess my refine my question is, what is the what does the patient think an exam should be or typically is? I I the problem now, I think, is with a lot of like the what I call this group on doctors where you can actually go and go on Groupon and you can get a what they would call an exam and it looks it's an exam uh, x-rays and read uh, the review of your x-rays for forty dollars here on Groupon 40 bucks 40 bucks on Groupon Four. you get those three but you never get touched damn you never get treated <laughs> and what what they don't know is on the other side of those forty dollars is a four thousand dollar care plan yeah they're good well, salesmen, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, I I don't know what they what they have people do in school in regards to histories, anyways. But like time frame, I I, I book an hour and a half, but I take an hour and fifteen or or an, or an hour based upon the person's questions. Mm -hmm. And I was talking, I've had Justin Dean on before, and and we were talking the other day, and he's like, "What the hell do you do for an hour and a half? You know, like why do you take so long?" And uh, yeah. I'm like, "I'm building rapport. It's like the first day is not about." like implementation really that much i'm building rapport so i i want the chance to get them to the end goal uh, i don't want them to feel i didn't take the time so i allocate the time but uh, in school how quick are your exams supposed to be so i am pretty sure the actual now there is a the fourth test that you have to pass to actually get your license i don't know if you had to do this it's supposed to be 12 minutes 12 minutes oh just for That's a uh, for a regional yeah. So no, they, I, I have, I mean, I obviously haven't taken it yet, but in order to get your last, um, your license, it's an OSCE, um, and you're supposed to be able to do the history and everything within 12 minutes. Oh man. But you don't have to write it. I, I, I'm not sure if you have to do like actual <laughs> notes. I'm not sure, but that'd be um, a whole different like test. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, so, but like, yeah, I went to the clinic and I am friends with an upper quarter that's in the clinic and he is, completely patient centered and stuff like that. And he, um, so he's somebody that I really look up to. And I went to the clinic and he, he had to do a whole history on me. And I mean, I wasn't there a good hour and 15 minutes. And I would say that I'm fairly not in pain ever. Yeah. And, and it still <laughs> took an hour and 15 minutes. I just started just blurting out stuff that I didn't even think about when I, I was driving, but I didn't even think about ever telling him. And then he was just really good at listening. And I don't know where now I, like I was talking about this back pain and next thing I know, 30 minutes had passed by and, and he figured it out immediately. I kind of already knew mm -hmm. um, what it was and stuff like that, but he immediately figured it out. But 
I mean, it took it took a good hour. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. We had a um, there was a couple instances where I, I, I had a later shift at the clinic at, at the student clinic, and so uh, you had to you, if someone talks about like they're in for a foot problem, but they talk about their thyroid. Now all of a sudden you got to chase that carrot for a little bit. And so there was a couple of people where like they had about 10 carrots to chase. They really took a lot of diligence on that, uh, on that family, yep. uh, history and personal history. Holy shit. I think I was there for three hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but that's the thing is sometimes people just, you just need to listen and people will feel better, especially when you get into the psychosocial aspect. A lot of the, the problems now, that you'll you'll see is it's just listening to you. Some people just need to be able to be listened to. And it's funny, um, I just saw because of Tiger Woods winning the Masters or whatever, and he's talking about the four back surgeries. He had four back to back years and he said that he uh he actually wishes he didn't have them even though he's playing well now. Uh-huh. And I saw one of the doctors comment on some of the he was like, It's funny, after all of these years and nobody noticed that his back problems kind of started right around the time that his life was falling apart, you know, he had the whole cheating scandal and everything like that. Like, mm-hmm. yes, of course he had all these things, but does anybody else, nobody else ever talks about like, Hey, what if his, a lot of the stuff was just, he needed somebody to talk to him like a human being and not like Tiger Woods, the cheater, everything mm-hmm. else like that. Like maybe some of these surgeries were unwarranted. I mean, he had four back to back years. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that was a challenging time. So I hope he had a therapist at least too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. You just never know. Some of these guys are just, they're so big. It's, it's hard. Yeah, man. I would put that therapist on lockdown, like gag order. <laughs> I just, I couldn't, so I, I grew up in Palm Beach, which is where Tiger Woods and the PGA and all that stuff is at. And where, when he got arrested, I couldn't believe um, a year ago or whatever for being on what they first said was DUI, but then later came out that he was on pain medication from his back surgery. Mm-hmm. Um I couldn't believe that the, the the police actually took him in and, and arrested him, especially in such a small beach town. I was like, why don't you just uh, drop him back off, I guess. And then, but I, I guess, I guess not everybody is like the whole lockdown. It's just like, he's a normal person. I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, the, um, I'm not going to, we're not going to close just yet, by the way, but I did, there was a couple of things I did want to ask you and I want to make sure I fit him in here. Um, number one is with, um, the my my the reason I wanted to do the interviews with students and I'm gonna do a whole little series here is that I want to see how um my purpose is with the podcast and and I'm not intending stopping anytime soon but also I need validation that something is occurring um and so that I wanted to see from listening to this many podcasts is there anything that actually was helpful to you as you're going through school um and uh, and tell me what it is and the effect if there was anything at all. I think the biggest thing I do definitely get is that communication part of how you make it seem like I'm just sitting in front of you talking when I'm listening to you or I'm listening to you and whoever the interviewer is talking. The fact that I want to listen to so much and when I don't want to listen to an audiobook because I'm tired after school, I go to your podcast instead of music Mm -hmm. uh, because I can I don't I can just hang out essentially with with you listening and, and learning at the same time. Um, and there's hundreds of nuggets that I've gotten from it. Um, recently off the top of my head is the Dan John one. Another one that I've gotten from you is the Tom Mashad, um, interview where it's anterior fall, um, envelope and all all those different things. There's, and every single one, you're going to take some nuggets, but I think more importantly, um, what I got in from this is here's this doctor who's been out 10 years, who, what seems like runs a very successful practice, who gets to talk to all of these big names, we'll call them. And he is still learning at all times. You can be, you know, Sebastian. Oh, interesting. I wouldn't have thought you would have said that. (laughs) You just have to, uh, you, you just have to continue to learn and, and be just like you. So I listen to you and I, you can't from the hour, hour and a half interview that you'll do with somebody like uh, Thomas Sean or Dan John, you're going to get a, a nugget or two, but you're also going to be like, I would have never even read Dan John if I didn't listen to this podcast. Mm, and I'm so glad you read him. <laughs> and I would have never uh, maybe even met or eventually met, uh, been introduced to Stu McGill or so many different people that you can just, after that, I'll go and I'll read their books or I'll listen to all of their podcasts. But you just give me this hour and a half, almost summary of what, what they're, what they're doing and then how you use it. And then I can go and explore 
everything that they have to offer. And I think that's the biggest thing is just taking something from everybody and then creating it your own. And uh, I, like Bobby Mabio says, I think he actually took this from Stu McGill is mastery is, is a journey. It's not a destination, but you should be on this journey to mastery. And the only way to do that is to fall in love with the process and fall in love with knowing more about the things that you offer, whether it's just solely low back pain or it's anything else. I, and I can tell that you have fallen in love with the human body in order and you love learning more and I'm the same way. So I just use this as a, Hey, this is what he's you know talking about now in his podcast, or this is what he's learned and I'm going to go explore. And it just, it's a good gateway to be able to, to understand and to um, learn a lot more. And I, I love it. I hope you never stop. I, I, well, I think one of my favorite shows was married with children and I think they went 15 years and they stopped and I was depressed. But I guess there there is a stopping point. (laughs) Um, I feel like eventually you might you might little retire, (laughs) stay in Huntington Beach though. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where I'd go. The uh, I I I I think I would like. I know one of my goals, at least for uh, travel, would be to make enough in life to where I feel like I can I can fly five hours or less and stay there for like three four days and then continue. Not only yeah. because I don't like long flights, but also because I want to acclimate to the time zones. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, I don't know if you've read uh, Why We Sleep, but that that I think between that and Dan John's book is the, the biggest two life changing books that I've read. Why I, We Sleep. I, um, yeah, I uh, I, ha- I have to get eight hours of sleep now. Um, if if anybody's listening to this and wants to read the book and doesn't want to spend the fifteen hours on audio. Um, <laughs> Uh, Joe Rogan has a podcast with the with the guy that wrote Why We Sleep. He's a, a sleep doctor out of I think he teaches at UC Berkeley now, but out of Harvard. And it's a two hour long podcast. Pretty much summarizes everything. But after reading it, you honestly will not not sleep eight hours mm-hmm. every night. Nice. It's just so important. I'll have to listen to the fifteen hour book on <laughs> book on tape probably. Oh. Well, nice. Yeah, good feedback. Actually, that's that's not what I would have expected you to say at all. So that it's it's helpful. Um, the uh, the next question is that uh, if I were to change or improve or add anything to the podcast, the next coming fifty episodes, what do you, what do you think I should do? Oh wow, I don't I don't know if I would change anything. If anything, I would say I uh, release them a little faster. Maybe not once a week. <laughs> that'd be that'd be horrible. <laughs> For, for me, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, it's crazy how. I mean, especially because these are like an hour long, so I'm sure this takes up a lot of your days. Oh, uh, it'd, it'd be. Hey, I I do them in bulk actually. They're um, I'm about th- this one's actually I'm gonna slide it right in the middle of of a one that's already uh, a bunch that are already produced, so it's gonna release on May eighth. Um, yeah. but I'm about six to eight weeks ahead on most things, and so um, I think to like i it, feel, it makes me feel very good knowing that i can just take my time and set up a good time to to work with people and or sorry uh, interview people and so on but um i honestly i i feel like i'm running out of inf- <laughs> things to share <laughs> i don't it's just it's you're always learning more things though i think that's another thing is that um there's more people to interview there's more things to to talk about at all times uh, I I mean I that's what I feel. I mean I'm not the one talking for an hour every week I guess so that's mm-hmm. just me but I feel like you're always coming up with some some other things yeah and other people to interview yeah hmm all right well I'll I'll think of something someone someone or did who suggested this I think did I, I it wasn't you you didn't you didn't suggest the student interviews right uh, I was not me. Okay, so I think so, someone else did. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's do student interviews. You guys are going to chew up a good one week a month. <laughs> what about what about patient interviews? I, I've I've thought about it. I've I've done some, um, uh, just here and there, but they were, uh, honestly, this will feel bad. Is that or I, this will sound bad? But if I interview the patient I'm working with, patients that I'm working with currently, I feel like I'm gonna. Like I'm not going to be able to relay all the details of their case accurately because I'm going to forget yeah. something because I tend to not read the notes and I just go off of what I recall. And so there I might forget all the details of like this, this lady, she actually, she, uh, she comes in and, uh, so she was gone for two weeks and, uh, mm-hmm. she tends to come in for, for resistance training and so on. And, um, so she went out of town. I know she went out of town and we were talking about where, and it was Portugal 
And so she came back the other day and I'm like, oh, well, you must be rested. You're like, we're like almost the same time zone. And she's like, that's eight hours away. I'm like, oh, wait, you went, wait, what? Where's Portugal at? You know? And so I feel like an idiot <laughs> sometimes if I don't have all the details. So I, I feel like if there's a new person to interview, uh, new, uh, a new patient, uh, I would probably, it'd probably be more popular or it'd probably be easier done for me. Um, but I stand to screw that up when like if if interns come in, they're like, "Hey, what's the history of this case?" I'm like, "I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't remember anything." <laughs> I think one of the maybe the markets you haven't tapped into is the pain science people. I think I haven't heard a lot of like, um, of course, a lot of them are, are in Australia, so that's harder. But even like Greg Layman or Annie O'Connor around here, I've heard some of their stuff on Mechanical Care Forum podcasts. Um, uh, yeah, the uh, I'm I'm supposed to link up with Mechanical Care pretty soon here, I think. And also, uh, Greg Lehman is scheduled. We didn't do it yet, but he's scheduled for release in about a month and a half. Oh, cool! That's awesome. I'm, I I enjoy hearing him talk. I don't know if you follow him on Twitter, but he definitely likes he likes you know putting stuff out there and really being the devil's advocate for a lot of stuff. So it's it's entertaining to see. Yeah, I'll probably let him lead the conversation a little bit on that. We. Uh, He's actually, he's part of the, um, our, I did, I don't remember if I even mentioned it before. We have a, we have an online, uh, con ed program coming on. Um, so the next five weeks, I think right after you, it depends. We're, we're going through the accreditation on stuff and California is mm-hmm. being really challenging, but, uh, Greg's in there. And so he does two hours of, uh, pain science within that, within that whole module on flexion and tolerant backs. Oh wow, that's awesome! Yeah, I, I, you mentioned it to me, but I wasn't sure when when I emailed you if you were talking about the low back pain um, book that you put out, um, the 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 part two, which is like the online little videos and stuff like that that you can purchase. I wasn't sure if that's what you were talking about or you were talking about something else. So I'm guessing now that it's something else. Yeah, there's like we've we've divided into a couple of things. Like so, there's the the book was I mean you know the whole history of the book, um, but th- this one is because like so we created this online course which was, so you haven't had to experience it yet, but it, it, when students get out, you have to, you end up going to like, say, um, uh, say Michael Shacklock, like neurodynamics is is not, there. there is no CEs, right? Yeah. And so you spend like $1,200 $1, going to a four-day course and then you yeah. don't get your credentialing. So, but you got to have most states for about 24 hours a year. And so you can get half of them online and half in person, but the ones online are just, they're just not very good. They're old yeah, yeah. stuff. And so anyways, we, we created a better one. That was the goal on that one. But there you go. yeah, that's awesome. Um, at this point, I'm, I'm a, I'm pro lot and students will be, and doctors will be on both sides of this, but I am totally for the moment that you get into school, taking as much as continuing education as you feel like possible with still doing your school load. Um, some people will say, wait until the later years, until you see, I've told you like, I will be at Philip Snell's fix your own back pain this this summer oh you're gonna love it you're gonna love it it's great yeah i'm excited (laughs) and but there's a lot of free information out there too that's another thing is if anybody's listening um they can message me if they need guidance on where to go look i have tons and tons of just free information um whether it's like let's say your youtube videos i have greg layman stuff is almost all free all his blog stuff i I feel like you should read everything that he puts out he puts out so much stuff that Mm -hmm. Um, there's just so much free stuff out there. So that's what I like to do is just get through all the free stuff, but also don't worry so much about the price. You're just investing in yourself. Right. Um, whether there's CEs or there's not CEs, um, I'm definitely going to take neurodynamics. Whether I take that be, with CEs or not CEs, uh, that, that doesn't really matter to me. It's just it's part of being a better clinician yeah. and being a, knowing more there's always more to know what's your what's your inst uh you want people to email you or instagram they can they can instagram me um uh, just message me geronimo 10 on there g-e-r-o-n-i-m-o one zero just if you have any questions if you're a student and you want to know more i can definitely lead you the way um another thing that i've really found out is all these doctors that you think are these big names and stuff like that like there are some celebrities that you're they all are awesome they all email back whether in some some in hours some it'll take a couple of days but i have messaged you for instance and you messaged me back and gave me all of your information um greg layman emails back same day and 
and you, I've heard that Stu McGill is, is awesome at, at replying and stuff like that. It's just send an email. Worst case scenario, people don't reply, but ask all the questions you can. Most people love talking about this and don't get a chance to. Mm-hmm. I and I love talking about all of these things. And in school, you get to talk about it, but everybody kind of has their own biases. And my friends don't want to hear me talk about low back pain. Mm-hmm. Um, my girlfriend doesn't want to hear me. <laughs> you, you, you have a very good stuff. point. <laughs> I think a lot of people, um, you need to be able to bounce ideas off each other. Just like you said that you go with, with Cody was living over there and you guys would just hang out and talk about that stuff. Some people don't have that. Some people aren't, aren't an island um, with the different clinicians um, around them. Join clubs, email, these, all, all of these doctors that you, you want to know more about, worst case scenario, they don't reply. Right. But I, most of them do. I, I, I agree. I think most of them do apply, re- reply. And actually, uh, so Dan John, he, uh, at presentations, he gives out his cell phone number. You know, and like, so you call him, he'll pick up. Um, but I think a lot of them are very humble about that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, you're, you're right about getting together with, so actually, do you know, do you know Ben, ben Ramos? Yes. Well, okay. I don't know him, but I've heard of him, especially from your podcast. Okay. So Ben is, uh, so he's about an hour and a half away from me. And so we, we took neurodynamics together mm-hmm. and, uh, there's no one around here. There's no one around for about an hour that knows it. And, uh, I've forgotten some. And so we're going to get together like next week and like we're going to hang out, eat, eat a tomahawk, you know, practice. And yeah. so like y- you guys got to get together and practice with each other because this, the skills go away, you know, and you don't get to, um, really break down all of the technical aspects of it to get better if you're with patients because no one likes to pull out a book when they're working with a patient, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I would say yeah, join clubs, um, join like the Facebook groups and stuff like that. There's more people around than you know. Um, from your podcast, actually, I, I saw uh, Garrett Elliott, Rehab Fix on Instagram. He was on here talking about Instagram and stuff like that. And he ended up posting on his Instagram that he's moving to Tampa. So I messaged him and Tampa's only about an hour away and we were going to get together once he gets, you know, all settled in into his uh, job as an associate down here. And I'm just, I'm going to soak up all the information I can from him, especially because there's no rehab to performance club here at Palmer, Florida. Mm -hmm. And he was the president of rehab to performance. I think the whole entire thing actually. Um, And I mean, he's just got so much information and Hey, practice on me. Let's talk. Let's hang out. And he was totally for it. He's like, yeah, anytime. Let's do this. Like, especially because he's not going to know anybody in Tampa <laughs> right. besides the people that he works for. So that's, that, that's another thing is don't be, and that's an hour drive for me. Don't, don't let an hour drive or um, being scared to send an email or maybe spending a little more on different continuing education. I mean, I see people not wanting to spend this money for a seminar and then, going and taking out some more student loans to, you know, buy a car or something like that. I'm like, really? Did you need that new car? Or, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. It just depends. I guess everybody's a little different. But you look good. You look good with the top down. Yeah, why not? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I know uh, Grant is moving over there. He, uh, like he, He's great. So, uh, by the way, if, you know, if, if people don't follow Rehab Fix, please follow Rehab Fix. Yeah. Like, yeah, when we when we're uh, circling back again, um, he's Grant's really good at communication, and he's he's been so successful on Instagram because if you look at how he presents ideas that are that can be complex, uh, he makes them simple and very actionable for people. And uh, so uh, I I don't know if you've heard the term already. The money's where the eyes are, and so he has currently like fifty thousand eyes. Yep. And, and so he's going to have a very successful practice once he's not an associate doctor, and he'll be perfectly fine. But uh, um, yeah. if you don't, if you don't learn to communicate, then you'll never get the chance. Not at all. So, um, anything you want to ask me before we close up, or you want to take the mic? You want to? You want to do? Uh, no, this, this is a Geronimo I, podcast now. <laughs> we've, uh, we've we've talked a lot. I, I mean, I've just gotten to know you, and I just I, I guess I'd like to just thank you for the opportunity and thank you for this podcast. It's awesome, um, and I hope to be able to get out to the next time you do this. Uh, to you said June eighth, I think is you're you're doing something at your mm-hmm. out of your office. Um, yeah, that's mid, um, mid exam week for me. So I'm definitely not going to be out there, but, uh, um, <laughs> but I, that's another thing is if you're in school, I would definitely say plan your vacations around different things that you can do. So let's say if I was able to, I, like I'm going to fix your own back pain, it's in Portland and I'm in Florida, I'm going to do an extra day and an extra day and see, Portland, but I'm also going to spend most of the time just learning. And then that night I can go see all, all this Portland, anything that 
I plan on doing vacation wise when next three years is all going to be centered around that stuff. So next time you do it, I will, I will probably be going to see uh, Southern California. I've never seen it. So. Well, well, thanks. Thanks for, I don't know if I'll do it again. We'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, as I'm finding writing, it is taking more work than I thought. I don't know how yeah. I'm going to speak for 12 hours. Um, the, it, just so everyone, I, you have hit a couple things in here, that I guess I'll um, reference. Uh, so number one, you, you mentioned the, the write up. Uh, I forget where was that? Write up. There was a or the the uh, the things I wish I knew in school. It was I know yeah, it's on the it, website it, somewhere. It's on your website. Just just type um, up. Uh, wish I would have known in school or something on the search yeah. bar. Um, and then it's on the show notes of one of your podcasts, but I really can't remember. Okay, uh, everybody should get that. It's free. Just just go in. Um, I was drunk on a plane and wrote it. Um, if you find any spelling errors, tell me. Uh, uh, in, in addition to like you mentioned fix your own back uh, as well. I don't get any money for mentioning this, but if, if you literally want to have the, the best or the, the best confidence, like you can com- communicate really well with patients when you're confident, you know what the hell you're talking about. And so when you go to fix your own back, like all those centered around one certain type of pathology, you're really damn good at it. And you'd be surprised how far a flexion intolerant back can create a symptom like uh, hamstring tightness or IT band issues or even some of that flank pain or even like sports hernias is a correlation in there with the uh, spinal hinge. So if you want to be really good at that kind of stuff, which probably people are going to look for you in a chi- as a chiropractor for, just go to that. It's it's cheap. It's cheaper than, than most seminars you'll go to, and it's really damn good. Um, the other half, I know that you haven't gone to neurodynamics yet, uh, Michael Shacklox, it's the other part, basically. Yeah. Um, it will change your da- your your damn practice. Um, so much confidence will come from both those. Uh, yeah, I think the only thing that would add to that is don't forget to go to the ones that don't have this cool like neurodynamics, McKenzie, all these that are that's really good to know. But you go to the ones where they kind of put it all together. I think that that's something that is um, like Greg Layman's course. From what I, I haven't been to it, but from what I understand, it's it's not so much learning. It's learning how to put all of these different things together. I think that's really important because I, I know that a lot of people say they, they come out of a McKenzie course and all they can do is McKenzie or if right. they come out of neurodynamics and all they want to do is neurodynamics, um, go to courses that kind of put it all together and yeah. just talk to people. Make I, would, friends there. I would agree. That's actually why the, that's one reason the workshop is happening. The, the one that I'm doing on, it's just putting things yeah, together. Cool. So cool. Cool. Um, go to Dr. Gonzalez's uh, workshop. <laughs> I yeah I we'll we'll see how far this goes. <laughs> I don't guarantee anything. I just know that people like going to seminars because their friends go and they like hanging out after. That's where you yeah, learn cool. everything. Um. Uh. Okay. I, I think I think that's all I have the questions I have. Unless you have anything else you want to say at the end. Yeah, that's it for me. What would be on your gravestone? What would be on my gravestone? Uh, I don't know. Um. This herniations don't cause low back pain alone. Uh, <laughs> like that. Wow, they're they're gonna they're gonna be like, wow, this guy was a orthopedic. <laughs> um, what about you? What would be on your gravestone? Mm, under promise, over deliver. Oh, uh-huh. so you've thought about this? That's not fair. You already no, you know, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't think about it. <laughs> I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything great like that. I did, yeah, I don't really have. I think, but after after doing as many rants as I've done for the podcast, I I, I have a couple default stories just hidden in the chamber. <laughs> well, right on. Um, then I'll close it up and, and just pause right there one sec, okay? Okay. Thank you for being on. Thank you. Okay, everyone, that was Geronimo. Thanks so much for being on. Uh, reach out to him. Like he said, um, you'd be surprised how many people actually respond back. So if you're looking to improve yourself as a student clinician, uh, he sounds like he's got a lot of stuff figured out and a lot of free stuff. So um, go ahead and check him out. Uh, I will put a link in the show notes to his Instagram handle. Uh, I guess lastly, I don't really have too much to share other than that, but um, if you're a student who thinks you have a unique thing to share uh, about your experience, about how the podcast has changed uh, your uh, your influence in school or the way you might practice out, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, and I'd love to hear feedback about how I'm doing. I, uh, uh, like, I, I don't know how many times I'll do student interviews, uh, if there's a popular response, I'll probably do them a lot more. But uh, I learn more all the time, uh, especially when I didn't learn. I had no idea who was going to say that. But uh, for the most part, uh, whatever you say, I will take it to heart. Uh, and let's see if we can improve this podcast together. And uh, if you're dating, dating Eagle Scout, lead people better than how you found them. See you next week. <laughs>